some of those ships scheduled to transit Panama to the U.S. East Coast had actually been rerouted via Suez Canal only for that route to then be attacked. So it's all a bit of a perfect storm for global trade. But while it's a nightmare for ocean carrier network planners, it's going to be uh, great for their bottom lines of, of some of those carriers and, and possibly for the middlemen, the 3PLs, the forwarders, the brokers. Does this leave shippers as the only losers here if this continues? Mark, John, fire away. I mean, I certainly hope not. I think, look, as Mark noted, on the, the Panama Canal, I mean, we're not seeing too much of an impact from my members' perspectives. They really haven't seen it. I think they're planning appropriately. But again, this is where you've got to have that shared interest. Again, it's not just going to be the shipper who pays for this. I think shippers are going to continue to push back, especially as they see any additional fees and charges that are unreasonable. And certainly we've got the Federal Maritime Commission who's paying very close attention to this. They put out their statement a couple of weeks ago saying some of these are reasonable, but they're going to pay close attention, especially after everything we saw during COVID. They're on top of it. So certainly if we start to see some of this, they will certainly hear from shippers across the board who are concerned about being gouged for some of these issues. You know, on that point, I'm glad you brought that up, John, because we saw, you know, I think it was two days ago, we had a column, guest column by Peter Friedman of ACTC encouraging the, the Federal Maritime Commission to use this as an opportunity to look at how they provide transparency on some of these additional surcharges. Because as of now, it's more of a checking the box of did you file it? And and granted, there's a lot of big issues there in the sense that the, the FMC, again, does not regulate rates. But I, I know Chairman Maffei has raised questions during the, the height of the port congestion of just how are these fees being accessed? Where are they getting this number? And and, when, and I thought what was really interesting, his point is like, when do they come off? So at what point does the industry say, hey, port congestion, it's in yellow, it's not in red anymore. So here come the sure charges off. And I think part of that is that doesn't have the same crunch in our industry because of the flexibility. Like these are worked out between commercial parties. No, absolutely. And it's unfortunately, it's it depends upon the shipper and the relationship with the carrier as well, how that all works out. If I may pivot slightly from those very good points, it, it feels to me like we're only just out of the pandemic. And just as we were expecting shippers to slip back into lowest cost thinking, all of a sudden, maybe resilience, supply chain resilience is, is back on the agenda. Do you, either of you think this will encourage some of the concerns about lengthy supply chains that became heightened during the pandemic to sort of rise back to the surface. I'm thinking China plus one, French shoring, you know where I'm going with this. Yeah, I think, Mike, first and foremost, I think many retailers, shippers and others have gotten away from just focus on low cost. I mean, that's been for a while now. The whole diversification effort started well before the pandemic. Much of it started with the trade war with China and the tariffs, where a lot of folks tried to shift away from China where they could. Some have been successful in moving their supply chains, some are not. I think folks are looking at any opportunity to diversify, whether it's China plus one, plus two, what have you. Many folks are looking at that, but it's not just the fact of the, the shipper or retailer shifting to find a new vendor, because that takes time to figure out. Make sure you've got a, a new vendor who first and foremost can meet your, your needs, can meet your you know, capacity, quality, has the right workforce, has a skilled workforce, there's infrastructure available in the country. Do they have the right sailing schedule? All that stuff comes into play. And it's just, it, it takes time to develop that. But there are challenges with, with doing that. And I think, you know, especially if this administration is focusing on getting folks out of China, they've got to provide some carrots and not just sticks to people to, to be able to do that. So looking at having actually a positive trade agenda that gives folks incentives to move. Reauthorizing programs like the Generalized System of Preferences or the Miscellaneous Trade Bill actually having free trade agreements that include tariff reduction and market access. Those are the kinds of things that are going to help folks to, to move their supply chains and having a rules of the road that actually meet 21st century global supply chains, not rely on old trade agreements that don't really meet what we need for today. So I think folks continue to look for opportunities to diversify. And obviously the China issue is a huge issue that everybody continues to look at, especially looking at Taiwan and issues like that and you know what's coming down the pike. So folks want to make sure they are, you know, moving what they can, but it's not easy to do. It takes time, unfortunately. And you've got to work throughout the supply chain to, to kind of make that happen. But again, that resilience and diversification is and has been front and center for quite a while. So I want to kind of get away from the notion that folks are really looking at low cost for their supply chains now. Yeah, I mean, Mike, to your question, you know, the way I kind of look at it, and I, 
again, this is just, I wrote about it for my column, so it's kind of fresh in my mind, is we're moving into a an economic sense, even given the continued North American strength of slower economic growth, right? And we know that uh, GDP is no longer a barometer of global container volume growth. And we also know that we're going to probably be in this kind of tight inflationary environment for quite a while. So that's going to keep carrying costs high, and it's going to keep companies very lean. At the same time, if you look at like the global supply chain on a container side, there's been a change in external factors. I think you can confidently say that there is far more geopolitical risk than there was 25 years ago. You could also say there is far more risk tied to climate change than there was 25 years ago. And then more recently, you could say to a degree, we're seeing a stronger, sharper, organized labor in the West. And, you know, I think, Mike, to one of your points that we had talked about before is you're also seeing greater destabilization. So there's a pullback on democratization, which is creating more authoritarian governments. And often those authoritarian governments aren't able to respond as well as, say, democratic governments can. So there's a, I mean, there, the landscape is completely changed, but at the same time, I would, and John, push back on this if I'm wrong, the demand to keep costs down despite all of this is probably even sharper than it was a couple years ago. I mean, look, there's always a focus on costs, especially coming out of the pandemic where you saw costs skyrocket that nobody had expected. So cost certainly is one factor that goes into all this, but it's not the only thing that people are looking at. I think, again, that resiliency is front and center because supply chains now are at the C-suite level and have been for quite a while. So folks want to ensure, one, you're getting the right product at the right cost, but make sure you actually get that product so that diversification is important. But again, cost is one component of the overall thought process when building out your supply chains. 